got done with a uh, series on God's amazing grace, and uh, if you weren't here for that, um, I get online, get caught up, get get submerged, submerging yourself in God's God's amazing grace because it will revolutionize not only your life; it'll revolutionize your relationship with God. With God, for me, I was a person that. Uh, Worked a long time at trying to be good enough, do enough, and trying to earn favor with God, trying to earn it. And earning his pleasure, earning, earning his, his grace, earning my prayers being answered, only to find out that it left me always reaching for more. Literally, I ended up, you climb up a ladder to find out find out it's against the wrong building. And what you're looking for isn't at the top of that ladder. And that's what religion will do to you. Religion will get you on that hamster wheel and get you continually running and never attaining. If you read two chapters in your Bible every day, religion will say, well, you could have read three. If you prayed for 20 minutes in a day, Religion will say, well, you could have prayed 40. Religion is man's attempt. Religion is man's attempt to reach up and attain God. It's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We will be like God. How? Independent and on our own from him. But the gospel is such a different story. The gospel is about a God that reached down to humanity. The gospel is about a God that so loved the world that he sent his only son, God. The gospel is a story of God dying for his creation. See, religion, religion demands you die for your God. The gospel proclaims we have a God that died for his people. That is amazing. That is why Christianity is different from every religion that ever existed on this planet. Christianity is not the same. Now, Christian religion, if you're a religious Christian, and it's all about works and all about what you must do, well, yeah, you're just like the rest of the religions of the world. But if you're a believer in Christ Jesus, if you are one of the, of the people of the way, if you are people that trust and rely on Jesus Christ for your righteousness, then you are radically different from religion because you are walking by faith in what Christ has done rather than trying to accomplish it by what you have done. That is, that's amazing. We're, gonna, we're starting a, a, a short series here on favor, having favor. And Wednesday night, I asked um, the group there that how many of you have ever been to church and had a message preached to you on the favor of God? And interesting enough, their experience was much like mine. All my life growing up in church... I never heard from, in a church that I attended, messages on the favor of God. Not one person raised their hand that they have ever heard a message on the favor of God. And that's kind of interesting, seeing that we are called to make disciples. We are called to preach to the nations. We are called to be, teach and transform this world and the, our culture to like heaven on earth, right? We're supposed to pray that, right? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We are heaven's rep representatives. We are in this world, but we're not of this world. The Bible calls us a peculiar people. And if you look at that, when it's talking about we're 
of peculiar people, that's not a negative thing. That is a positive thing. There's, have you ever had that experience in your life that there's just something different about you? I don't get you. You should be upset. Why aren't you upset? What, what makes you tick? There's a glow. You just, what is it about you? You're peculiar. And that's not a negative thing. It just means you stand out from the norm. You stand out from those that are struggling, that have a cloud over their head everywhere they go. That you change the atmosphere when you walk into a place. Have you ever had anybody ever say to you, well, I don't normally do this for people, but for you, I'll make an exception. I don't, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I'm going to do this for you. Have you ever had that happen to you? If you've ever had that happen, then you've experienced favor. You experienced favor. And God wants you to have his favor. We at Karis New Testament Church, we just don't meet on Sunday mornings and hope that everything goes all right. We actually have a mission. We have a goal. We, we, we are deliberate in what we're called to do here in Ambassador, Michigan and the surrounding communities. And our mission is to proclaim and expand the kingdom through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's just a short sentence, but it's filled with so much there if you understand what the gospel is. The gospel is Jesus is Lord. And our whole worldview comes under the lordship of Jesus Christ. He's a, that Jesus is Lord over everything, over the president, over our military. He is Lord over everything, over our homes, and that our whole worldview, our whole understanding of how the world is supposed to operate, this mechanism that governments and, and the arts and, the, and entertainment and, and knowledge and wisdom fall, all falls under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And our method, our method is activating the church in the grace and the wisdom of Christ to take their vocation, their calling, to their location, sphere of ministry, affecting the situation for the kingdom of God. God has a design and a purpose, and his fingerprints are all over your life. And he desires each one of us to take the grace and the wisdom that he has given us in Christ Jesus to be influencers in the world. You might have never seen yourself that way before. But each one of you are called to be influencers for the kingdom of God. The Bible calls us ambassadors for Christ. You are an ambassador for the Lord Jesus Christ. And his spheres of ministry, what does ministry mean? See, we use these words in church, and most of us don't really know what they mean. Ministry means to serve. And you can serve anywhere. You can serve in your cub cubicle at work. You can serve in the classroom. You can, you can serve on the assembly line. You can serve nailing shingles on a roof. You can serve anywhere. So often we think that our ministry has to be within a church building. Or it has to be some sanctioned outreach of the church. I'm sanctioning you right now. Everything your hand touches is your ministry. Do it for the glory of God. Effect, effect the situations for the kingdom of God. Have you ever experienced, went into a workplace or a room or experienced a situation where you walked in and all of a sudden, man, it's cold. It, it, it just got quiet in here. It got, it's cold. It seems there's just an atmosphere. Have you ever experienced that? That you're stopped by someone's house and you can tell they must have just got done with a huge argument because it's something's going on in here. Or you, you walk into the, to the break room or something and all of a sudden they just stop talking. And there's this weird f feeling. See, those are, that's, that's atmospheres. 
And we have a greater one living within us than he that's in the world. And you have an opportunity to change atmospheres and change the environment because of him that lives within you. I don't know, I don't know if you guys are getting this or not, but we are called to be change agents within, within our culture. Within our culture. So what are these spheres of, of influence in our cultures? One is religion, and really I should change that to the church because religion has such a negative, negative kind of uh, description to it. But the church, the family, the family is a huge sphere of influence in this world. That's why they're trying to eliminate your responsibility as parents. That's why they're, it takes a village to raise a kid. I don't want the village at my house. The family is under attack. Mothers, to be a mother nowadays, I've never imagined this, but it's, an, it's actually, if you listen to most people in modern culture, they act like it's a negative thing. That it hinders a woman from becoming all that she can be. My wife Amanda is an amazing woman. And my home would not be what it is if it wasn't for her being a loving mother. And fathers, they're disposable. They're, they're, we don't need fathers. You know, they're the butt of every sitcom. They're not really needed in today's society. Do you see how there's a war going on? Business. Business. That, that's a huge influencer in our world. You can have a business that does it for the glory of God, or you can have a business that does it for greed and, and for, the, for the wrong motives. Business manipulates government, and government manipulates business. You could be in a business, you can have your own business, and you can have influence in our culture. You can have influence on your employees. You can have influence on a community. Then government. I mean, history, you just be a student of history to see how there are good governments and there are very bad governments. I won't spend a lot of time on this. Education. Education is an influencer in this world. We see, we see that not, it started in our higher academia, universities and, and colleges, and now it's twickle, trickling down. I guess they, it's called trickle-down education into our public schools. And then celebration, which is the arts, the entertainments, sports, all the things that we celebrate and get excited about, and it's our entertainment in life. If you go back just a few hundred years, you see that the church was on the forefront of entertainment. They were in the for forefront of the, art, of the arts. They were in the forefront of music. And because... The church would not change and adapt to the things that were happening. We fell behind in all that. We, we locked up the imagination and the creativity of the church. See, these are mountains of influence. These are the gates of the city. These are cultural shapers. And most of us experience this 
every single day. We all experience this every single day. We are being influenced. We are being shaped. It. We are being molded every single day through one of these spheres of influence. You are being molded by your church. You are being molded by your family. You are being molded by the business that you work in. You are being molded by the government. You are being molded by the education system. You are being molded by the media, the news, the propaganda that is continually spewing out of your TV screen. You are, our kids, and you too, don't, don't, I'm not deceived. We are so manipulated and controlled by celebrities. And there is a war for the souls of humanity. There's a war between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light, between life and death, between the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. Here's a perfect example of the sphere of celebrations in the sports arena, influencing culture and using a platform that was given to them to proclaim the kingdom of God. Is the sound on, on the uh, computer in the back there? Okay, let's watch this real quick. I can only give uh, the praise to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for giving me this opportunity. I mean, glory to God, first and foremost. We wouldn't be here without him. Unbelievable. All glory to God. separate journeys led them to the NFL and the Philadelphia Eagles. They sought an outlet to come together and created a way to share their faith. We're marching. We're marching. We're marching. The chapel for us here is that in the NFL, since our Sundays are taken up, you can't go to church. So you had the opportunity to attend chapel, which is like a small church service, and we're able to get our word in. On every Monday night, we have a couple's Bible study. We have a Thursday night team Bible study, and then Saturday nights, we actually get together the night before the game and just kind of pray, talk through uh, the word, what guys have been reading, what they're struggling with, and just kind of keep it real with each other. To have that here in an NFL um, facility like this, it's, it's really special. How important is it for you to use your platform to glorify God? I mean, it's huge. Um, our number one goal on this earth is to make disciples. Uh, that's the only job that we are pretty much, we want to do. Um, so faith in football this Sunday is huge. It's a platform that we have to draw people to the word, uh, to Jesus. Uh, it's something that we don't take for granted by any means. Uh, it's obviously responsibility, but we love that. The major thing I found out is they're regular people. I don't care how much money you give them. I don't care how much fame a person has. Um, if they don't know who they are inside, it really doesn't matter. Really, what I preach to the players is that football is a platform. It's not your purpose. And the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. Hey. 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 We baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. Faith alone in Jesus is what leads to salvation, and then the works come out of your salvation. See, Christianity is the only religion in the world where you can't earn right standing with God. You can't earn heaven. You can't earn your afterlife. You can't earn good karma, whatever other religions think. It's the only religion in the world you can't earn it because it's already been earned. Jesus already earned it. It's all about accepting Jesus, and that's it. Don't miss that point. Don't miss that point. They asked, they asked the uh, head coach, and I feel, I feel kind of bad because I wasn't even rooting for the, I didn't even, I'm not a big football fan. I was rooting for the, uh, the Patriots, and, but Tom Brady, he, he's a believer too, but, uh, but I didn't realize revival was happening in the Philadelphia locker room. And this was all after the fact, and, and, 
the first words they asked the head coach when he got up on that platform, they said, explain to us how you went six years ago from being a high school coach to winning the Super Bowl. Talk about setting somebody up with the perfect ball to hit. And he says, I'll, you heard him. He says, I want to give the glory to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for giving me this opportunity. Tony Dungy, he's a former NFL coach and a, and a strong believer. He, he was ridiculed and, um, over social media because he literally said that he believes that the Philadelphia Eagles were going to win the Super Bowl because the quarterback hears from the Holy Spirit. The quarterback literally says that he listens to the Holy Spirit when he's on the field. See, there's people that mock praying before a football game. You know, you got one team over here, Lord, help us to win. You got another team over here, Lord, help us to win. So which one does, what prayer does the Lord hear? Listen, saying a religious prayer is one thing, but going on to the field in partnership with God Almighty is another thing. That's a huge difference. The quarterback said, said that he has his sights on something even greater than the Super Bowl, and that he wants to become a pastor. This is huge. This is huge. And this is how these spheres of influence influence our culture. And this is how the favor of God works. It takes someone that's a coach, coach in high school football, and six years later, puts them right in the middle of the biggest sporting event in the whole entire world. That is awesome. And that's what God desires to do with all his children. So, how, you know, we're called, you know, so often I feel like people think, man, Chad, the vision and, and your mission and what you want to do, you want to change the world from Vassar, Michigan? You want to change the world with this little group? Yeah, I do. And I hope you do too. But how do we do it? See, if you're sitting here this morning and you're thinking that we're going to change the world through our own strength, if you, we're going to change the world through our own ability, if you're going to change the world with our wisdom, our education, our finances, what we have to offer, then yeah, I'm right with you. Forget about it. But if we're going to change the world through Christ's ability and heaven's resources, and the wisdom of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit. I tell you, nothing is impossible. We partner with God to create kingdom change in this world, because there is two kingdoms. Tony Dungy, I didn't finish that. He, 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 he was getting ridiculed. They, they said, don't use your platform of NBC Sports to talk about your faith, to talk about these type of stuff. Tony Dungy tweeted back, he says, he says, NBC pays me for my commentary and for my thoughts. This is my commentary, this is my thoughts, and they will not change. There is a war. There's a war. I mean, just recently this week, we've seen it. And this isn't a political statement. So don't take it as a political statement. But we had a national talk show person say that a person that hears Jesus speak to him is mentally ill. I want to tell you, if you don't hear the Holy Spirit, if you don't hear God talking to you, there's something wrong with you. He speaks to me every day. I talk to him, he talks to me. And if this is mentally ill, I don't want to be right. But there is a war. 
There was a war against the kingdom of God, and there's a war, and we are warring against the kingdom of darkness. The word charis is, in the Greek, is a Greek word for you that might be new to Charis New Testament Church and not really know what charis means. Um, it's actually pronounced charis, uh, and that's where, where we get charisma from. Um, charis is the Greek word for grace, and it is defined as the merciful love and grace by which God turns us to Christ. You know that? He chose you. You didn't choose him. He turned you to him. He forgives us. By his grace, but then he keeps us in his grace and strengthens us and increases us in the blessing and inheritance of those who are in faith of Jesus Christ. It's all about grace. It's about grace and faith. It's all done by God's grace, but we appropriate it by believing it, by having faith. Right? If I put a million dollars in your bank account and you don't believe it, guess what? You're not going to enjoy it. So if God has given us everything that heaven has to offer through Jesus Christ by his grace, but you don't believe a single word of it, guess what? You're not going to enjoy it. We change the world by grace through faith. And that produces the favor of God in our lives. Let's get to the word. In Luke chapter 1, verse 26, it says, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying. She was troubled. Think about this. She was troubled about him calling her highly favored and blessed among women. Probably because no one's ever welcomed her that way. There's some of you sitting here that no one's ever welcomed you the way that your Heavenly Father wants to welcome you. There's some of you that just think that you're just a simple peasant girl or a shepherd out in the middle of the field that his father never even called him home to stand before the prophet to be anointed as king. Heaven sees people totally different than the earth sees people. She, w she, was, she was troubled thinking, what kind, of, what kind of manner, what kind of greeting is this? There are people that heaven favors that the earth has not recognized yet. Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and sh shall call his name Jesus. Verse 32, he will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And we are in that kingdom right now. See, favor marks you and sets you apart from others so that you can accomplish a purpose that God has given you, that you could carry the purpose of God and that you could birth it. That you could birth the purpose of God in your life. God's favor is amazing. Of all the women in all of Israel, Mary found favor. Mary found favor. Notice Mary was highly favored. And if you can be highly favored, guess what? You can be lowly favored. The favor of God is different from the love of God. 
How many of you know that you can love somebody but not really like them? And God loves everybody. God loves everybody, but there are those that he really doesn't like. And you're going to think this sounds bad, but think about it. God loves everybody. God wills the best for every man and for them to be blessed despite of their behavior. That's God's will towards humanity. That is his love towards humanity. For God so loved the world that he gave his very best. He gave Jesus. But if a person, if a person does not embrace that, if a, if a person all he does is act mean, he acts ugly, he acts demonic, there's not much about him that God likes. Even though he wills their best, even, will, even though he desires for them to prosper, even though he desires for them to live the life that he has planned for them. God loves you because he is love, not because you are lovely. He loves you, and there's nothing you can do about it. God desires the best for your life, and there's not one thing you can do to change that desire. But then you have people like Daniel in the Bible, who has an angel, the same angel that showed up for Mary, and says, I have come, for you are greatly beloved. You are greatly beloved. Greatly beloved. I thought God loved everybody the same. God loves all because he wills the highest for every man. God loves because he desires the highest for every human being. Love is not a feeling. It's not this emotional mush Do you know you can't fall out of love? Love is a deliberate act of the will. If you no longer love someone, you have deliberately chose not to love them. Love, God's love, agape, is so much higher than fleshly Valentine's love. God loves us. He desires the highest for us. Why? Because he wills his love towards you. He wills his love towards you. Here's the definition of the love of God. Love is the committed commitment of one's will to use their energy and resources to invest in the best possible outcome for another's sake, independent of what it does for them. A biblical world w- word for God's love would be charity. God loves you and wills the best for you and will do everything in his power for you to be blessed, to be happy, to be prosperous, even though he gets nothing in return. He gets nothing in return. God has agape. God has charity. He has love for humanity. God invests in you for your sake, not for what you can do for him. God wills happiness for every human on the planet Earth equally, regardless and independent of how they treat him. Jesus died for sinners. Jesus died for his enemies. And we are all were sinners, and we were all enemies. God didn't die for good people. And God loves the world. God loves all of humanity. However, 
those who God wills the best for are irritating and disappointed to him, disappointing to him every single day. If you're a parent, I think you've experienced this. Yeah, you love them. You want the best for their life. But what they're doing, the choices they're making right now is irritating the living daylights out of you. You love them. I love them. And I want the best for them. But right now, I really don't care for them too much. I don't like them too much. You don't think God's that way? That's why I, I think it's important for you to remember. Don't judge your parenting skill, skills based on the outcome of how your kids are acting. If, you, if you're doing what God's called you to do, because there was a parent that was the best parent, never did one thing wrong, did everything right, and he lost all his kids. That was God. Look how his kids turned out. So don't judge yourself based on the actions of your kids. Judge yourself by your actions. God loves everybody, but not all of them does he like. Psalm 711 says, God is angry with the wicked every day. God loves them. He wants them to come into his kingdom. But the way that they're acting angers him. Romans 5, 8, 9. But God demonstrated his own love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Right? That's the whole world. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, shall we be saved from the wrath of God through him. God loves everybody that even when you were a sinner, he sent Jesus Christ. But now that you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, guess what? He likes you a whole lot better. You make him happy. Hebrews 11.6, and without faith, it is impossible to please him. God loves everybody, but not everybody is pleasing. God loves you, but sometimes... When you're, not like, when you're not putting your faith in him, you're not very pleasing. Do you understand this? So you got this angel that shows up and tells David he is greatly beloved. So what is he saying? He's saying not only does God love Daniel, but he also likes him. God, he is greatly beloved. He, I, I like what you're doing, Daniel. What was Daniel doing? He was a captive. He was a young um, Jewish boy in, in the captive in the Babylonian system. And they were trying to change him to their culture. And they, were, they seen that he was smart. He had wisdom. And they, and they were trying to make him into their culture. So they tried to force him to eat like they ate. And what did they eat? They ate meat. That was offered to idols. And Daniel says, I will not eat meat that is offered to idols. I will only eat vegetables, fruit and vegetables. And it says that the Jewish boys that only ate the fruits and vegetables, their complexion was better than the Babylonians. They were healthier looking, the stronger. And you know what religion does? Oh, we should start a Daniel diet. We should only eat vegetables and fruits and stuff. (laughs) That's not what it was about. It was a man putting his faith in God and says, I will not eat those things that are offered to idols. I will not bow my knee to their cultural system, the Babylonian system. I believe in the God of Abraham. I put my trust in the God of Abraham. And God raised Daniel up to the second position in the Babylonian kingdom. Get this. You don't have to be in the top position to have much influence in the world. (laughs) 
God loved Daniel, but he also liked him. He's special. The angels in heaven have heard about him. Mary was greatly favored, we see. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. We are running late. Mary was highly favored. This must have been amazing to her to hear this, being just a young peasant girl. The God of the universe, the ultimate judge, likes you. You have found favor in his sight. The question is, does God love you? Or does he love you and he like you? Are you beloved or are you greatly beloved? Would you like to find out how you can get on our Heavenly Father's favorites list? If you answer that in your heart this morning, that yes, I want to be on God's favorites list, you're heading in the right direction. Because that's the first step, is desiring the favor of God to rest upon your life. Desiring to be likable to our Father, desiring to be obedient. That's a word we don't like using. The favor of God means that God is fond of you, that he really, that he really likes you. When he likes you, there is an influ- influence that comes on you where the very charisma, the grace of Christ, which Christ means what? Anointed. And what does the word anointed mean? It means to smear or to pour upon. So God wants to smear, pour upon you, lather you up in the favor of God. He wants you to be so slippery in the oil of his favor that nothing that the world throws on you can stick. And what it does, it makes others like or cooperate with you whether they like you or not, whether they want to or not. It's God's divine influence on humanity. Everyone here whose success depends on other people getting along, receiving them, or liking them, then this message should be very important to you. Because you have to have favor with men and women. Are you a business person? Are you a mother? Are you a student? Are you breathing today? Then you need the favor of God in operation in your life. And that is every single person in this room. So let's look at favor and how it relates to people's success in the Bible. In Luke chapter 2, verse 52, it says, And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. If Jesus needed the favor of God, and he needed to increase in the favor of God and man, I think we need to... Also, favor can go two ways. Notice that you can have favor with God and you can have favor with men. You can have favor with God, but not be very pleasant to men and women. Lots of Christians are this way. That God likes them, but the people don't care much for them at all because they're jerks. Because they're self-righteous. Because they're not walking in the love of God with humanity. See, the Old Testament, the Old Testament had the Old Testament prophets that were like this. God liked the Old Testament prophets because they were obedient. They, they obeyed him. They spoke the word of God, God no matter what, if it was good, whether it was bad. But the people didn't like them. 
They feared him. John the Baptist was this way. He had a great ministry. But he wasn't much on winning friends and influencing people. Have you ever known ministers that, that are great ministers? They can, they can I don't talk, talk, say it was me, but th that can preach a great message, but when you get around them, their personalities just are abrasive and they're jerks. They got favor with God, but they have no favor with man. Jesus grew in favor with God and favor with man. Others have great favor with men, but they have great personalities. People work with them. They can get people to do things and, and, and get people motivated, and people like them, but they have no significant legacy or mark in history because they had no favor with God. What they did didn't have the fingerprints of God or the signature of God on their life. Just imagine if we could grow in influ influence with God and man like Jesus did. What a tool that we could be used for the kingdom of God to change our cultures, to change our communities. Because Jesus was a likable guy. People don't realize that. Pe people liked Jesus. The opposition that we face shouldn't be because we're jerks. That's why the news, that's why the media will find the most abrasive type of, of representation, representators for the church and put them on the news. I mean, Jerry, Jerry Falwell, when, when he was live, he, he was, as far as his teaching and being good, you know, things of the Bible and all that, he's great. But when he got in front of a TV camera and he's representing the church to the rest of the world, he was very abrasive and put off. We need people that are able to have the favor with God but also have the charisma and the favor with men also. That's why they always try to get, every time they put a Christian preacher on, on the TV, they always try to get him with gotcha questions. Like, do you believe that homosexuality is a sin? If I, if I ever was asked that question, it'd be simple. It'd say, here's what I believe. That every single human that has ever walked this earth was born into sin. And the only salvation for sin, the only remedy for, God, for sin, is to trade your identity from fallen man to a new creation in Christ Jesus. So it doesn't matter what I think is a sin. We were all born sinners and we are in need of salvation. They all, do you see that, how that battle happens? How that, and if you don't go in there, think, if you go in there just with a, a church answer, it can be very abrasive to the world. And we're supposed to love the world. We're supposed to be inviting them into this kingdom. The Bible shows us that opposition comes on people when they have the favor of God on their life. But it doesn't become because you're a jerk. See, a lot of people think that if the world hates them, that that's a badge of honor. The world didn't hate Jesus. The world did not hate the early church. But they did face opposition. And who did they face opposition from? Those that were in the political and religious social systems that was controlling the people. Rome and pagan religions hated the Christians. Those that made their money off making little idols and all of that. They said that, but the people, they had great favor with the people. Jesus, the people loved Jesus. But the religious leaders could not stand what he was doing to the religious system that they had set up. Herod could not stand the idea of a Messiah, an anointed king to come and take his place. 
People loved Jesus. They liked him. But jealous religious leaders and the rulers such as Herod were the ones that despised and opposed him. Look at this. John chapter 7, verse 31. But many of the crowd believed in him, and they were saying, when the Christ comes, he will not perform more signs than those which this man has, will he? So what they're saying is, they loved him, they believed on him, they're saying, he's, he's done so many miracles, this has to be the Christ. And it says, the Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things about him, and the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to seize him. So out of envy and out of jealousy because of the favor of God that was on Jesus, the Pharisees sent officers to arrest Jesus. And now watch what happens. Verse 45, the officers then came to the chief priests of the Pharisees and they said, said to them, why did you not bring him? The officers answered, never has a man spoke the way this man speaks. So you got these Religious leaders that are envious, they're upset, they're mad, they send the, the temple guards to go arrest Jesus. They go arrest Jesus, they stop, and they hear what Jesus is saying. And the favor of God is on Jesus. And instead of, instead of arresting them, they fall in love with them. They start liking them. And they come back and say, hey, and they say, why didn't you arrest him? And they, it's like, uh, we, don't, we never heard anybody talk this way. That's amazing. The force of favor was on Jesus. This is so powerful. That's why it's in God's control and not ours. God is the one that puts favor on people. Because if it was in your control, you... We, we would misuse it. And I'm going to, I'm only ha halfway through my message, so I'm going to stop right here. But do you see, just in these short couple um, characters in the Bible, I mean, Jesus is a huge, is the number one um, one that we should Im imitate. But we're going to go and look at how the favor of God rested. We're going to look at Esther next week. We're going we're to look at how the favor of God played huge parts in these people's lives to change nations, change the world. And these people were average. Mary was a peasant girl. Esther was a foreigner in captivity. And she becomes queen. How does that work? Joseph goes from being thrown in the pit by his brothers, sold into slavery, put into prison, to the prime minister of Egypt. David goes from being a shepherd boy, watching his father's sheep to be anointed king of Israel. Peter. James, John, go from fishermen to being the ones that Jesus entrusts the future of the church to. Listen to me. You're sitting here thinking, well, I don't think God likes me very much. See, I didn't get to get to the end of my message, so I can't leave you hanging. You're sitting here thinking, you know, I, I guess God does like, love me, but uh, there probably isn't much in my life that's very likable. Maybe God's not going to use me. Well, I got good news for you. God loves Christ. God loves Christ. Jesus, and he made him who knew no sin to be made sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, in Christ. God puts you into Christ, and when God looks at you, guess what he sees? 
He sees Jesus. He sees you in Christ. And not only does he love you, but he, oh, he likes you. He desires the best for you. He, he, he's, he, he's just waiting for you to awaken to that great love, that great, um, his partnership, his friendship, the things that he wants to do with you. Just like a father, just like a father desires so much for his children. Because they're bone of his bone, they're flesh of his flesh, they're his blood, and he desires the best outcome for their life. They want, he wants to leave a, a, a legacy on them, that, that through them they can continue to, to be radical world changers and influencers in the world, that they can become all that they were created to become, just like a father and a mother desires that for their children. You are the children of God, and God desires that for you. And all he's waiting for you is you, you to partner, to believe him, to let him help you. To have faith. To have faith in him. So this morning, don't let the devil say, God doesn't like you. That's why he put Christ, he put you in Christ and Christ in you. Because he, he loves hanging around you. He desires to be in your presence and you in his presence on a continual basis. Amen. So this is good. We got to learn how to operate in the favor of God. And we're going to do that in the next couple of weeks. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you for your great love. We thank you. We thank you that you had an, a mystery, a mystery of the ages, and that was Jesus Christ. And we thank you that that mystery has been revealed to us. And you have put your church, you have put your children, you have put us into Christ. And we are no longer walking in our righteousness, but we are walking in his righteousness. And Father, we just ask through the power of the Holy Spirit, through the teacher of the Holy Spirit, through the friend that sticks closer than a brother, that he would pull the blinders off our eyes and that we would see our heavenly Father and that we would hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. You are God's favorite because you are in Christ and God desires to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all you could ask or think according to the power that works in you. Father, we just ask for the favor of God to rest on your children here in this church this morning, that we would walk out these doors knowing that we have divine favor from heaven on us and that there's nothing impossible for us to achieve for the glory of Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. We just love you, we praise you, and we celebrate you this morning. And all those that agree said amen. Amen. Be blessed, church. Have an awesome week. Look for the favor of God operating in your life.